large part of it was, was done during the summer program and it's been an ongoing uh, project. Okay, so the, the idea of this project is to provide a useful boundary condition for modern simulations, like large yeah. simulations. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also a conceptual experiment. So, the, the motivation in terms of application is uh, to reduce the cost of uh, uh, turbulent simulations. Uh, in particular, uh, it is very expensive to simulate the, the flow very close to the wall, because the, the large uh, scales, the energy uh, generating scales, turn out to be very small same scale as the dissipation uh, scale. Uh, while, while as you go away from the wall, the larger scale, the larger you have an inertial range in between, or you could put your areas here. So the idea is try to get rid of this lower region in the flow, and instead of imposing a boundary condition at the wall, impose some synthetic boundary condition farther away from the wall. <coughs> uh, the idea that we wanted to uh, explore is whether we could impose a boundary condition that we could obtain from a, a buffer layer flow, uh, so the flow in, in this region, and just, just impose the, the top of that flow as a boundary condition for the overlying flow. Then so do some kind of uh, reduced order model of the flow in that region to be imposed to the overlying flow. Uh, I should mention a couple of words that have been uh, that have happened recently uh, and are related to this work. First one by, well, actually, the first one historically would be the one by Botrin and Fonio. I hope I pronounce that word. Uh, so these guys built uh, uh, reduced order models based on POD uh, at some height away from the world. In, a, in spirit, it's quite similar to what we're doing. Uh, so they will impose some reduced order model of the real flow that they obtained through a previous DNA simulation. Uh, then they would obtain some reduced order model of it. This is a quite simple uh, thing, just just for visualizing what they were doing. Like they would impose something that looks more like that. Okay. This is just one more thing, like four or five, uh, and then impose that as a boundary condition. And the other one uh, would generate uh, a boundary conditions dynamically from the simulation uh, as as it is going by rescaling the flow above to a smaller size at some plane below, uh, um, imposing the scaling loss that you get across the long layer. This, there's this linear scaling of the energy carrying scales as, as you go across the long loss zone. So this project will explode, exploit that idea. The pro this one is very attractive, but the problem is that it needs an overlying flow that has a thick enough a logarithmic layer, meaning it it's very good for large Raymond summer. It's actually Raymond summer independent because you can impose this at any height that is scaled with the flow thickness instead of more units. But then you need to have this upper plane, otherwise, if, it, if the boundary layer is thinner, you can impose this. So, um, all inspiring works that, that are behind what we've done uh, would be this seminal work by Chaplin and Kuhn, which imposed some kind of sinusoidal wave-like uh, velocity plane uh, above the, the buffer layer to uh, f uh, jump gathering the, what they knew at the time of the, of the flow in this area to see whether with that they could reproduce the flow or statistics of the flow under that plane. So it, it would be the opposite thing as what we would be doing, which is imposing some kind of funny uh, flow field at some height point and looking at what's happening above. Another work that's been important for us is the, the, the simulation by Piomeli's group in which they imposed uh, um, periodicity in, in the flow uh, close to the wall. So they essentially seeded the near wall region with a, a lattice of minimal units that were periodically repeated so you could reduce the, the computing cost. You would only compute one of those, right, and then repeat it uh, all the way. Uh, and, and then the 
this would be actually part of the same simulation. So they, they were simulating this box together with, with that box at the same time. They were fully coupled. In that sense, our condition is different because it just uses some stored condition at the top of, of that small block, say, to provide as a boundary condition for the overlying flow. And then uh, part of the conceptual experiment thing in, in our project was to test uh, minimal blocks like this extracted from different flows. There's the, the, the uh, famous minimal unit in, in channel flow of Moin. And recently, uh, Jim Wallace at the previous Hammer program actually uh, looked into the statistics of uh, turbulent spots in bypass transition. And uh, they saw that statistically they are pretty much equivalent to uh, fully developed turbulence at the same Reynolds number. So we could try to use these transitional regions also to uh, deduce a minimal unit from them. Okay, so uh, let me comment a little bit on, on that deduction of minimal units from uh, transitional boundary layer. We actually decided to take that one a step farther than, than in the previous work, which was bypass transition, and use something that was even less chaotic, like this very controlled K-type transition, which is a DNS that was conducted at CPR and has recently appeared at JFM. So, uh, for this kind of very controlled flow, you don't have to really spots moving around. You can sit somewhere and watch a flow go by, and it's very organized, it's repeated periodically, both in, in space and, and in time. So, the idea is to grab some region of the flow there, uh, and do a parametric study on the size of that region so, so it would serve as a, as a minimal unit. And for that, we used uh, several criteria, uh, namely uh, checking that the statistics of the flow restricted to that region would resemble those of fully developed flow at, at that Reynolds number. And you can see that in this figure, if you have the comparison of the fully developed flow, and, and uh, the statistics of, of the, the flow in this region, so, so they, they follow some of the trends. <coughs> and then also we would check that at the, at the top plane, which we will use as the boundary condition, uh, we are capturing the energy carrying landscapes uh, of the flow. Uh, and we can do that by looking at the uh, energy spectral density of, of the structures in that region. This, this is a plot that contains span noise landscapes and stream noise landscapes. So red regions were, would be regions uh, where, or, or say, landscapes that carry most of the energy. And those are contained in the box. This would be the limit of our box in size and, and already uh, the energy of those structures would be weak. And uh, something that we try to use to, to construct our reduced order models is the MP, the direct, uh, sorry, um, dynamic mode decomposition, uh, which is a quite powerful tool. It didn't prove so useful in terms of building models for us. Uh, it's very good for capturing uh, coherent structures. Now, in something chaotic, that our conclusion was that you would need to give all the modes to really uh, get a, a, a model for this. But one, one thing that we could make out of it is uh, identification of very clear wavelengths uh, when you look at modes independently. So that could help us to find <laughs> the, the, the wavelengths, or say the size of our box, so we, we would make the box as periodic as possible. So if you choose a, a box that goes from here to here, you are essentially repeating periodically this Chevron-like structure without forcing uh, something that is not periodic to be periodic. So, so that would smooth our model. Now, we, we did not jump directly to imposing these uh, minimal units obtained from uh, uh, transitional flow. Uh, instead, we took several steps with a progressing level of idealization in our flow state. So, we first run from a, some snapshot, some initial uh, condition, a full DNS, and store the time history of the flow in the plane where we would later impose our conform boundary condition. Then, starting from the same snapshot, we would impose those as, as boundary conditions, which 
at least in principle, should provide exactly the same solution, other than uh, discretization errors, things like that. Uh, and then do the kind of model reduction that we would do on, on our models on, on that time history, which is, I didn't mention, sorry, it's essentially Fourier transforming in space and in time, uh, followed by truncation. Uh, so, so then this first model would be the same thing as the exact historical boundary conditions, only dropping the, the less significant, less energetic ones. Uh, and, and then uh, we would go to the idea of imposing a lattice by running a smaller channel, a minimal channel, which would be just one third in span and, and streamwise direction as our full channel, but, but with the full are it out, and store those historic boundary conditions do the model reduction and then impose a lattice of those as a boundary condition for the full flow. And then eventually uh, impose these uh, transitional minimal units as boundary conditions. And we tried two, we tried one in the very early stages of transition where things are beginning to develop and something in, in a more towards fully developed state where things have lost uh, coherence and it looks much more like, like a channel. So, so we run the, all these cases to compare how things would change by using different kinds of minimal units. So these are results of uh, velocity fluctuations and Reynolds shear stress here. Uh, this is the, the collection of, of results for our different models. They essentially fall on top of each other, except maybe the, the ones from the boundary layers which de deviate a little bit more what you have is essentially this, the, the, the behavior you would have in the full channel, and then there's this accommodation region near the wall between the, where the boundary condition is imposed at 100 classes, and say 200 classes, where the, there are these kings where the, the flow above accommodates to the boundary condition, which is somewhat extraneous to it. Even if it's, if it's a statistic, even if it's say the structures that were photographed in the, in the boundary conditions are different from the ones that are generated above. So that's, that's one of the problems of these kind of models. The Reynolds stress looks to fall on top of the, of the Reynolds stress that you would obtain in a full channel, but it, it's a, it has a little bit of deficit, and that's, that has to be, oh well, uh, this, before I go to that, these kind of kinks, you can see that they developed also in uh, the other models that I have mentioned. And even in the work of Chapman and Kuhn, which was the other way around, is the model. So that deficit, deficit in, in UV stress uh, is compensated by an additional shear stress of the, of the mean profile. So then you have the, the profile somewhat falling under, having more slope than the, than the full profile. Now this effect is small in our case. Again, it was also observed by Mitsuno Kimenev, and in their case it was larger because probably because the condition was uh, uh, more in, say, in conflict with the overlying flow. I'll, I'll go to that next slide after. Uh, you, you can see how the, the boundary condition is colliding with the flow in the pressure fluctuations. This is something that is not always reported, but it's, it's an important thing. You, you can see in the, in the experiments by Mitsuna he how the pressure fluctuations would overshoot as you, as you approach the wall. Uh, so, so the pressure is going to enforce the incompressibility of the flow and not let the, say, structures that are overlying uh, collide with the boundary condition. Uh, we had similar problems early on, like uh, this uh, red curve would be the exact boundary condition from the time history of the flow. And even though you couldn't tell in the uh, velocity statistics that there was this problem, it, it is there and it, it's important you will notice it in the pressure. And how we uh, managed to fix that in our case, well, fix it, no, but mitigate it quite a lot. Um, is by making sure that the advection of the boundary condition matches exactly the advection of the flow just above. So that they can travel together and adapt to each other and then the pressure of the is uh, So, to conclude, uh, the one important thing is that you can get, you can forget about the buffer layer, just impose some boundary condition on the top of it, and still recover a logarithmic layer. Uh, the, the boundary conditions 
for, for that kind of uh, of work simulation can be obtained from a wide variety of transitional uh, uh, sorry from, from from a variety of, of buffer layers and they are essentially interchangeable so you could have your minimal unit of buffer layer packed and use it to run in, in any in any turbulent simulation uh, you will have those things in the velocity that I was uh, showing uh, and, and especially in the pressure, you will have that opportunity in the pressure and it's important that you match as smoothly as possible the, the boundary condition motion with, with, the, with the overlying flow to, to mitigate those pressure kinks. And uh, I should also acknowledge Provis was behind the, uh, some of the ideas in this project and the money really and the funding uh, entities which were the near project by NASA and the summer program in CPR. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Um, right. Um, um, the, the kind of uh, boundary condition you apply is straight forward cross state. Um, would that be useful if you also actually look at, say, velocity gradient or maybe two layers of velocity distributions so that you can kind of re, you know, uh, reduce the, the initial or the boundary layer distortions? Do you know? I'm not sure I understand. Right, okay, so uh, the boundary conditions you applied, you obtained and then applied is velocity. Uh -huh. field. It's a velocity plane, isn't it? Yes. Uh, would that be useful if you actually also apply, say, velocity gradient as well? Oh, a boundary uh, condition for the velocity gradient. Yeah. Or maybe you know, two layers of uh, velocity. Uh, so, so you would impose a, a forcing at a different plane so you get the velocity field that you want or something like that. Not quite a boundary condition. Yeah. So you're like spreading the influence into two places. Right. Yeah. Those kind of things could help ease the, the pressure problems, probably. And then concerning velocity gradient, uh, so the, the simulations that we've done are DNS. In that case, you only need boundary conditions for the velocity. And now this, the idea would eventually to apply to to LES. In that case, you would need boundary conditions for the rate of stress, right? So you can obtain that also from the model, because you have in the, in the model you have in the information that you will also filter out with the in the LES. So from that information that would be filtered out, but but it's stored in the model. It's cheap. It's not. You, you can obtain all the rate of stress information that you need to. <coughs> I don't know if that. Okay. So, for the question, maybe I can ask a question. You would like to ask, please. please. Uh, you spoke about uh, the reduction in the other world. Uh, you spoke about the QD. For you, what is uh, the best basis? Yeah, we, we just did a very simple Fourier transform in streamwise fanwise. Uh, we did feel a little bit of filtering to smooth the, the edges in the case of the transitional. Uh, information and also Fourier transform in time. Uh, and in that case, when we, when we use channels, we have to do a little filtering in, in time because a channel, when you, when you get to the end of the day, it's not like the beginning. And then truncation by the error. Is it flow independent? It, it, this needs to scale in volume units. And one thing that we have not incorporated in the model is the effect of large scales. And, and we would need to uh, do that. That would be the next step. The idea would be to, I guess, shrink or enlarge and also change the intensity of, of the uh, bricks, depending on whether you are on top of a, uh, below a high speed region, higher you tower or a low speed region, something like that. Okay, Ricardo, thank you very much. Okay.